Until recently, when most people were asked to describe Louisville, Kentucky, they'd say, it's the place where the Derby is run. Or maybe, it's the birthplace of Muhammad Ali. But now, Louisville is known for different reasons. The city has become a flashpoint. The place where Breonna Taylor was shot and killed, in her own home, as police broke down her door under a no-knock warrant, looking for drugs that weren't there. It's also the place where David McAtee was shot and killed by a member of the National Guard as they confronted a group of black citizens out after curfew. But the problems that have fueled the protests on the streets of Louisville didn't start with the death of Breonna Taylor or David McAtee or George Floyd in Minneapolis or the many other African Americans unjustifiably killed in recent years. The issues that led to these protests, police brutality, health and wealth inequities, mass incarceration, started much, much further back. Some say to the 1600s, when the first enslaved Africans were brought to this country. Slavery shaped America, and most definitely the state of Kentucky. But that history, and its legacy, have rarely been explored, or even acknowledged, here in Kentucky. I would say it is pretty common across the state for white Kentuckians not to consider their connections to slavery. Whole generations of enslaved people just disappeared from Kentucky into the cotton fields of the Deep South. One of the strongest connections people need to understand is time. It's only been 152 years since the Emancipation Proclamation was even put into effect. And since that time, we still have seen like grotesque inhumane ways that Black people in this country, particularly in Kentucky, have been treated. It's been very, very difficult generation after generation for the children of slave owners to accept the children of slaves as their equals, as their their colleagues in this business of moving the world forward. There is no way to get around the damage that the system has done in the Black community, whether from slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, discriminate, all of these things have had such a horrible impact. Scholars and thinkers like those you just heard have spent years exposing the long, deep roots of racial injustice that grew from slavery to Jim Crow to now. Perhaps the best way to look at our national history is to see it as an intertwined system of many smaller histories, of this state, of cities like Louisville, even the history of families. This is The Reckoning. I'm Dan Gediman. Now, all of this, the mall and everything used to be part of Oxmoor. On a sunny June day in 2019, cousins Bridget Johnson, Russ Bolds, and his sister Lisa Bolds Williams drive together to visit Oxmoor, a former plantation in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm really looking forward to seeing yeah. the space that our ancestors occupied. Yeah. And see how they preserved it. Oxmoor sits right behind one of the big shopping malls along Shelbyville Road. A busy commercial corridor dotted with strip malls, restaurants, and car dealerships. It was built by Alexander Bullitt in 1787 and is still owned by the Bullitt family today. But few people shopping at Oxmoor Mall know much, if anything, about the plantation it was named after, a place where generations of black people were enslaved. Seems like I heard somewhere down the line that there was one of the slave quarters that was still standing, or is that incorrect? No, that's true. Okay. The ancestors of these cousins lived in one of these slave cabins. At one time, there were nine wooden cabins lining the long driveway leading up to the mansion at Oxmoor. Wow, so they had the slave quarters. Oh, yeah. But then, isn't that weird? I wonder, was this gated off back then? Like, what stopped them from running? <laughs> you know? The cousins had never met until this weekend. For a long time, they had lived in different parts of the country, 
Russ in California, Bridget in Maryland, and Lisa in Indiana. Now they all live about an hour away from each other in central Indiana, where their families had slowly migrated after emancipation. Bridget and Russ found each other when they started exploring their family roots on a genealogy website. But until a few weeks ago, neither of them knew that any part of their family history was tied to Oxmoor. This is the entire, well, not all of it, of course, but this is the main. Wow. Yeah. yeah I would have loved to have seen this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder what Mama's reaction would have been. Russ had been deeply engaged in genealogical research for many years and had amassed many documents and photos pertaining to his ancestors. Bridget was a relative newcomer to genealogy, but equally passionate to learn as much as she could about her family's past. But one of the main challenges for African Americans like Bridget and Russ is not being able to get back before 1870 in their family trees. That's the year the U.S. Census first noted formerly enslaved people by first and last names. For centuries before that, the only way the enslaved were identified was by their first name, making it exceedingly difficult to trace families from enslavement to now. Bridget and Russ would still be in the dark about several of their enslaved ancestors if it weren't for a single document that sits in a vast collection of bullet family papers at a Louisville archive known as the Filson Historical Society. Did you do some research today? Yes. Henry Bullitt, Alexander's grandson, left behind an unpublished memoir about growing up at Oxmoor in the years before the Civil War. In this memoir, Bullitt mentioned several people who were enslaved at Oxmoor, including one particular woman, Eliza Sanders. Actors will be interpreting this and other archival documents throughout the series. Mother gave Eliza to her daughter, Mrs. Archibald Dixon of Henderson, Kentucky. Eliza's husband, Jim Sanders, belonged to Mr. John Burks. And in order to keep them together, Mr. Dixon paid for Jim Mr. Burks' price of $1,500. By knowing the last name of Eliza and Jim Sanders, it became possible to search for them online in the 1870 census. And there they were, living with their four children in Henderson County, Kentucky, where another Bullitt family plantation was located. Following their descendants down through the generations led to Bridget and Russ. We set up a video chat so I could show them what I'd found. I want to encourage you to stop me at any point and ask questions, okay? Okay. Um, Okay. All right, so let me jump in here. The Bullitt family papers at the Filson Archive include thousands of letters, legal documents, and family photographs. In one faded, sepia-toned photo, an older brown-skinned woman sits holding a small white child, her cheek up against the baby's head. Her white hair is pulled back and parted in the middle, a plaid scarf draped around her neck. Her name is Louisa Taylor. And I'm almost positive that's Louisa, your fourth, I believe it's your fourth great-grandmother. Wow. Wow. Louisa Taylor was born in July of 1805. At the age of five days old, she was given as a birthday present to seven-year-old Mildred Fry, who was to be her mistress for most of her life, even after slavery ended. When Mildred was 21, she married Alexander Bullitt's son, William, and moved into Oxmoor, which William had inherited. As Mildred began having children, Louisa became their nursemaid. Louisa had six children of her own, one of whom was Eliza, who eventually married Jim Sanders. Bridget and Russ are directly descended from Eliza and Jim. I asked them what they thought of this new information about their ancestors. Um, I'm just, I'm very emotional right now, so just, just go ahead, please. Russ? Well, I'm just, I'm just in awe. I'm looking at this woman and, and, and seeing so many different Features of her and some of my other cousins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's weird. So she does look familiar to you. Yeah. Learning about the connection to Oxmoor helped fill in a missing link in Bridget and Russ's ancestry. But Bridget says she's frustrated that the search for these links is so hard for African Americans 
never mind the difficulty of tracing her roots back to her African homeland. We're pretty much the only race of people that don't know where they came from because I don't know who my original people were. I don't know my language. I don't know my culture. I know none of these things because it was all erased. That erasure happened on many levels. And it starts with the stories passed down by white enslavers. There's an entire literature of memoirs written in the late 19th and early 20th century by elderly Southerners reminiscing about the good old days before the Civil War. An example of this is My Life at Oxmoor, written by Henry Bullitt's brother Thomas, which takes a nostalgic look back at life on the plantation under his parents William and Mildred. The Negroes were well cared for. They knew and recognized it. They respected my father, and they were much attached to my mother. They were cheerful and contented. It was shown in their daily work and in their fun-loving exercises at night. They loved to dance, and often danced without music, except patting with the hands on the knees. And this they learned to do to perfection. Memoirs such as these helped shape the story Kentuckians would hear about slavery for many decades a story which would then be repeated well into the 20th century. In these homes were many contented servants, born and reared for several generations in the families of their present masters, who served them with unswerving loyalty and devotion, and who, in turn, were held in genuine affection. Many of these family servants of the big house were privileged characters. And under no circumstances would they have accepted their freedom from their beloved white folks. That's from a 1940 book called Slavery Times in Kentucky by J. Winston Coleman that's constantly referenced in other history books as an authoritative text. The book was in print until 1970 and can still be found in libraries across Kentucky. History books like this one helped shape a myth that slavery in the state was mellow, well-ordered, maybe even pleasant. Kentuckians have now and did have during the era of enslavement a, a myth of mild slavery. Patrick Lewis is a scholar in residence at the Filson Historical Society. White Kentuckians have always argued that they did slavery better, nicer, kinder, gentler. And quite literally, you can read this at almost any point during slavery and afterwards. At least we're not Mississippi. No, we're not Alabama. And, you know, it is a way of of minimizing white complicity in the violence of slavery and the exploitation of slavery in Kentucky by saying, well, at least we're not, you know, grinding people to death in in Louisiana sugarcane fields. Of course, they they white people in Kentucky will hold the threat of selling enslaved people into those same conditions. But there is always this belief that somehow black people are better off in Kentucky than they are in other places in the U.S. One of the ways that Kentucky did differ from states like Mississippi and Alabama was in the number of people who were enslaved. In 1850, Kentucky came in eighth on the list of all 15 states where slavery was in force. There were about 200,000 people enslaved in the state, roughly 20 percent of the population. By comparison, Alabama had nearly 350,000 enslaved people. But here's where it gets interesting. Even though Kentucky was right in the middle of the pack in terms of the total number of enslaved, it was third in the nation in terms of the number of households that enslaved at least one person. What that means is that slavery was spread across many facets of Kentucky life. So in addition to farm laborers and household servants, the enslaved worked in mines, factories, and riverboats. The state didn't have huge cotton plantations like Mississippi and Alabama, and only five slaveholders in the state enslaved more than 100 people. But it did have many smaller plantations, like Oxmoor, where 53 people were enslaved in 1850. And it appears from reading the Bullitt family papers that enslaved labor was a critical part of generating their family's income. In the early 19th century, Oxmoor primarily grew hemp, then the most lucrative cash crop in Kentucky. William Bullitt kept careful records in a ledger book of how many pounds of hemp each enslaved field hand was able to process. 
breaking open the stalks to remove the fibers inside. And harvest time was news worth writing about for the entire Bullet family. Here is Mildred Bullet writing to her son John in 1849. My dear John, the hemp is this night all finished being broken. A most delightful spell of weather we have had for the business. Lewis set the example of going over 300 pounds, and it has been followed by all the young men. I believe Daniel broke in one day 364 pounds. Nowadays, you probably know hemp as the plant that produces CBD oil. But back then, the hemp that was grown in Kentucky helped support the cotton plantations of the Deep South. Vanessa Holden is a professor of history at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky contributes to this larger economic system by providing the supplies needed to harvest cotton, that hemp is used for the cotton sacks, that hemp is used to bale up cotton, one of the nation's most important exports in the antebellum period. So following the money allows you to link all sorts of economic ventures, ultimately, to slavery. In addition to using enslaved labor to grow hemp, the Bullitt family papers reveal another way they made money from slavery, by leasing slaves. In Kentucky, enslaved people were hired out to work in just about every area of commerce and industry. It was also popular in cities like Louisville for people to hire an enslaved maid, or maybe a chauffeur without the capital investment of buying one. And for someone like William Bullitt, it was like printing money, because all of the living expenses of the enslaved people were paid for by others. April 14, 1860. W.C. Bullitt hereby hires to A.J. Anderson two Negro men, George and Dick, for the sum of $309.60, payable the end of the year and secured by note. Anderson is bound to work them on his farm, on which he now lives, and nowhere else, to clothe and feed them well, furnishing them each a good suit of winter clothing in the fall, a pair of boots and hat included, and to pay all doctor bills, and to return said Negroes to said bullet on the 25th day of December next, unless providentially hindered. Not only were enslaved people hired out for long-term periods, but also as temporary workers for a few days or weeks. Again, historian Patrick Lewis. And they're this sort of, almost this communal labor source that anyone in the white community, non-slave owning uh, or, or whatever, can pull on at harvest time or when you're building a new barn. We see this a lot in, in counties that produce hemp. You know, there are skilled uh, hemp breakers, there are skilled uh, rope walkers, and they, they can sort of move around through an agricultural cycle, and the entire community, uh, white community, can, can sort of pick up and put down that labor as they need. Banks and other financial institutions were a critical part of making slavery profitable. For example, hiring out an enslaved man or woman could have a downside if the work was at all dangerous. So enslavers often wanted to protect their property. Sharon Murphy, a professor of history at Providence College, has written extensively about the banking and insurance industries in antebellum America. It's a big investment to own a slave. If you've just hired the slave, you don't have the same financial investment. You don't have the same incentive, perhaps, to uh, be more careful with these slaves. So the slave owner, in hiring out, would sometimes take out an insurance policy to make sure that if something happened to that slave while they were working on the railroad, while they were working in the mines, while they were working in the tobacco factory, that they would be compensated for that. And there were other financial tools that families like the Bullets could use to build their wealth. Just like mortgages where you have a home and you use the home as a collateral or a car loan today, you have the car as collateral. In the South, uh, one of the main forms of wealth in the 19th century were the slaves. Um, So it's actually kind of natural for slaves to be used as collateral on loans. If you were white and had a decent reputation, you could often purchase a new field hand or cook on credit, just like a car or living room furniture, and pay the loan back with interest months later. Newspaper ads for slave auctions from this period often advertised the terms. 
The undersigned will, on Monday, the 23rd of February, 1852, at the courthouse door in the city of Louisville, sell to the highest bidder at public auction on a credit of six, twelve, and eighteen months, five Negro slaves, two women, and their children. The purchaser to give bond with approved security, bearing interest from the day of sale until paid. All the financial tools that helped enslavers purchase a workforce were also in play if a farm or other business failed. Loans were called in and banks foreclosed on property, including taking possession of enslaved people. Professor Sharon Murphy says satisfying creditors was one of the biggest reasons enslaved people were sold. So when someone defaults on a loan, if the slaves were part of the collateral, the bank or the creditor could do any number of things with those slaves. They might put them on the auction block um, and sell them and get the proceeds from it to liquidate that debt. They might decide to own the slaves for a while. So the the creditor can just take possession of the slaves themselves. Um, and not only creditors could do this, banks did this. So those those slaves... They might be sold. They might get a new owner, but they're still living together on the same plantation. They might be split up and sold uh, to areas where there's more demand for slaves. They might be just sold down the road to another plantation nearby. There's any number of things that could happen to them. But at, at all times, their their existence is kind of in limbo, especially when you have these foreclosures going on. Not only did enslaved people show up as assets in loan foreclosures, they also figure prominently in wills and estate settlements. Again, Professor Vanessa Holden. There's a whole other world of moving enslaved people as chattels in between individuals. For many white Kentuckians, enslaved people represented the single largest asset in their estate, worth more than their home, land, or livestock. So great care was taken to make sure those assets remained in a family. Enslavers see slaveholding and being able to move slaves into the next generation as a way of shoring up their family's prospects beyond their own lifetime. I give and devise to my son William C. Bullitt and his heirs forever the following slaves to wit. Abraham, Big Bill, Hope, Little Bill, Celia and four children, Betsy, Titus, Absalom and Dolly, Rachel and her two children, Sally and Alec, Dinah and her child, Louisa, Ake and Annie, and Frank, his children, and Big Jack. When Alexander Bullitt died in 1816, he left a large estate to his six children. To his son, William, he left the land and buildings that made up his plantation, Oxmore. To his other children, he left some combination of land, stock, and other valuables. But he also bequeathed to each of his children other human beings, which were theirs to keep, to sell, to borrow against, and then pass along with any additional offspring to their children and their children's children. That's how chattel slavery worked in this country. In other parts of the world, enslavement was usually something that only affected that one individual, perhaps someone on the losing side of a war, or paying off a debt of some sort. But from the earliest colonial times in this country, white Americans defined enslavement as an inherited state. Once a woman was enslaved, her children were also enslaved, and their children's children. Slavery became something black people were born into, an inheritance that African Americans and our country as a whole are still reckoning with centuries later. Cousins Bridget Johnson, Russ Bolds, and Lisa Bolds Williams drove several hours from Indiana to visit the plantation at Oxmoor where two generations of their ancestors had been enslaved. Almost immediately after arriving, Bridget had tears in her eyes. It, this is where people were owned. No different than owning that statue right there. They were piece of property. And for a group of people to look at another group of people as cattle 
It's just, it's just really sad. It's just very, very sad. I would love to. My mom, my grandma. I would love for any of them, you know, that's already gone to witness this. I, I want to bring my kids here now. I want them to see this. We walked through the former plantation, taking in the various buildings where their ancestors had worked. The mansion house where Louisa Taylor nursed all the Bullet children, and her daughter Eliza served as Susan Bullet's maid. The laundry where Louisa's other daughter Tina had washed the Bullet family clothes. And then, eventually, to four white brick buildings. They are the last remaining slave dwellings at Oxmoor. Russ, Bridget, and Lisa approach the smallest of the four buildings. The door is open so we can go in. Mm-hmm. Why is that? No windows. Expense? Extravagance? Bridget touches the door to the cabin. You can go in. After pushing the door open, Bridget pauses, then turns away. Russ and Lisa go ahead and walk inside the small cabin. Wow. Not a lot of space, is it? Can you imagine a whole family living in a right next place? Wow. That would have been tough times, huh? As Russ and Lisa continued exploring Oxmoor, we found Bridget outside the cabin, looking out over the estate. I was okay until I touched the door. It's very small. It's small for one person, let alone family. I was fine until I touched that door. But I felt like I was going to my home. There are other places like Oxmoor across Kentucky and other African Americans like Bridget, Russ, and Lisa who don't know their history regarding slavery. But understanding that history is more than filling a gap in a family tree. Slavery in Kentucky had a social and economic impact that echoed down the generations until today. And that's true of white families as well. In our next episode, a Kentucky family learns of its connection to a slave trader. That's next time on The Reckoning. The Reckoning was written and produced by me, Dan Gedimo. Our editor is Loretta Williams. Rhonda Rogers Van Dyke is our assistant producer, with production help from Nancy Rosenbaum and engineering from Kojin Tashiro. We had marketing help from Creative PR and legal assistance from the Dinsmore and SKO law firms. Our fact checker is Kathy Brady. Much of the music heard in the series, including our theme music, was composed by Jacory 1200 Arthur with additional music from the Artlist Music Library. Our voice actors were Mark Foreman, Susan Linville, and Alec Voles. We had research help from Penn Bogert, Dave Morgan, Shirley Harmon, Tom Owen, James Pritchard, and Jenny Cole. Our series is produced in partnership with Louisville Magazine and Louisville Public Media. Our thanks to Josh Moss at Louisville Magazine and Stephen George and Erica Peterson at Louisville Public Media. Major funding for this series was provided by the Community Foundation of Louisville, the Norton Foundation, Eleanor Bingham Miller, Emily Bingham and Stephen Riley, Victoire and Owsley Brown III, Nina Bonney, and Gil and Augusta Brown Holland. Special thanks to the Filson Historical Society, Dr. George Wright, Walter Ray Watson, Cheryl Duvall, and especially to Val Jones. And our deepest thanks to the Johnson, Bolds, and Stites families for letting us into your lives. <laughs>
For an even deeper dive into the subject matter, subscribe to The Reckoning Podcast by visiting reckoningradio.org slash podcast. On our website, you can also find a detailed bibliography, free educational curricula, and over 100 oral histories of formerly enslaved Kentuckians. That's reckoningradio.org. Thanks for listening.